Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mohammed Alarin. I'm the president of Queens, and I want to welcome you to Queens and to this very special event. This annual law lecture is sponsored by Ms. Nesta and Mr. Zuckerman, both of with resolutions. They have been very supportive of Queens in many other ways, and we are very grateful for your support. And you will hear more about this, including the prizes they support later on from my friend, my colleague, and the life fellow of Queens, Professor Richard Fentiman. So as I ask Richard to come to the stage, can I just ask you to join me in thanking our wonderful sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to add my welcome to those of the president. It's a very great pleasure in particular to welcome Lady Rose here this evening. Although as a Supreme Court Justice, she needs no introduction, I thought it might be useful for me, as it were, to establish her credentials. Uh, she is a Newnham graduate, which makes her a member of the home team, uh, so to speak, although I'm bound to say that her career took rather a different path thereafter when she moved to Oxford for the BCL. I hope that she might be forgiven that youthful indiscretion. But she also has a connection with Queen's, which I feel I should mention. She attended my supervisions in the conflict of laws in 19, 19 um, well, perhaps, perhaps it would be ungallant to say exactly when, although I'm bound to say it was my first year of teaching at Cambridge. Suffice to say that as a callow youth, wet behind the ears, new to teaching, she very much kept me on my toes. It is often said that as a new teacher, you need to keep at least a chapter ahead of your students. In the case of Lady Rose, it had to be a whole book. Knowing her as I did then, it is no surprise that she now sits in the Supreme Court. Her theme this evening is the role of the Privy Council, a court which is not a UK court, yet somehow is a UK court a court whose decisions are not binding here, but somehow they are. It's a court born of empire, which is still going strong. She will, I know, unravel this enigma and answer the question she has set for herself, a relic of empire or useful body. Lady Rose. Thank you very much for that gallant introduction. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here this evening and uh, uh, to speak about the work of the Privy Council. Uh, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, commonly referred to as the JCPC or the Board, has been described in its modern form as a unique body, akin to an international court a court that nobody starting afresh would design, a relic of empire or a valuable selling point for the jurisdictions it covers. I would describe it for the purposes of this evening's lecture as an evolving institution generating important case law. The breadth of the JCPC case law is wide, from a dispute about the letting of a church pew in Montreal in 1877 to a stonemason's employment rights in Hong Kong in 1990. Each JCPC case comes with its own local flavor. And this evening, I hope to provide you with an insight into the recent work of the board and a sense of some of the issues that it deals with and an awareness of the influence of its jurisprudence. So some of you may be asking yourselves, well, what exactly is the JCPC and how did it come into being? It's a court of final appeal for the UK overseas territories and crown dependencies, and for those Commonwealth countries that have retained the appeal to His Majesty in Council, or in the case of republics, to the Judicial Committee itself. It used to be housed in 9 Downing Street, but today it shares a home with the UK Supreme Court in the Middlesex Guildhall 
on Parliament Square in London. And of course, it shares more than that because the same justices who are appointed to the Supreme Court also sit as the judges on the, com on the Judicial Committee. The Privy Councillors are a body of the great and the good, now numbering over 700. There are some roles in public life here which bring appointment to the Privy Council as a matter of convention, such as being appointed a cabinet minister or being leader of the opposition. Being a court of appeal judge in this jurisdiction is one of those roles. Appointment involves a visit to the palace and a ceremony which takes place as part of one of the regular meetings of the Privy Council with the monarch. So when I was sworn in as a court of appeal judge, I attended a meeting of the Privy Council in March 2019. I swore the Privy Councillor's oath. I knelt before the late Queen and kissed her hand. So this means that every judge who is appointed to sit in the Court of Appeal in England and Wales is also qualified to sit on the JCPC. And so also our senior judges in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and we often invite them to come and sit with us. It used to be that senior judges from New Zealand, India, other JCPC jurisdictions could also sit with us when those countries had the JCPC as their highest court. For example, Sir Shadi Lal, who in 1920 became the first Indian to become Chief Justice of Lahore, was appointed to the JCPC in 1934 and served for four years. For the current JCPC jurisdictions, due to changes in the law, that's not presently possible. However, the government is considering a proposal that judges from the jurisdictions of the board should be made privy councillors so that then there can be legislation put in place that will enable them to come and hear cases with us. In its origins, the JCPC's power to resolve legal disputes flows from the notion that the king is the fountain of all justice throughout his dominions and exercises jurisdiction in his council, which acts as an advisory capacity to the crown. The JCPC was then formally created as a statutory body in 1833, when Parliament enacted the Judicial Committee Act. The powers of the JCPC are largely limited to making a report or recommendations to His Majesty in Council. We humbly advise His Majesty either to allow or dismiss the appeal, and the King subsequently makes the appropriate order at a later Privy Council meeting. But there are some republics who have still retained the use of the JCPC, but do not have the King as their head of state. Those are Mauritius, Trinidad and Tobago, and Kiribati, and their appeals are directly to the board. In the 1930s, the JCPC was said to be the final court of appeal for more than a quarter of the world. Over the last century, there's been an inevitable decrease in the extent of its jurisdiction, with many of the countries establishing their own apex courts. Appeals from Canada and India were ended in 1949, with Australia, Hong Kong and New Zealand following in 1986, 1997 and 2003. The last Canadian case heard by the Privy Council was in 1960, despite appeals being ended in 1949. This was because cases which had already got going prior to the legislation abolishing appeals to the board were allowed to continue on their way. The last case concerned an oil drilling project. The statement of claim in the matter had been issued on the 5th of December 1949, and the act came into force making the Canadian Supreme Court the exclusive final appeal court a few days later on the 23rd of December. Having got in just under the wire, as it were, the appellants were able 10 years later to bring their appeal to London. The account of the hearing by the Canadian barristers instructed described the, quote, rather tweedy business suits, unquote, worn by their lordships at the hearing. One of the barristers, rather ungraciously, I think, described the lunch they were served as one of the worst meals of his life. <laughs> because of the inclusion of Brussels sprouts. <laughs> it's worth noting from the outset that the history of the JCPC is one that is tied up with empire. 
And so it's entirely legitimate to ask the question whether it should still exist as a final appellate court for jurisdictions outside the United Kingdom. Some Commonwealth countries keep it as their apex court, even though they've become independent republics. And ultimately, of course, it's entirely a matter for each country to decide whether it wishes to use the JCPC. And St. Lucia, for example, agreed recently with the UK government that it will no longer send its appeals to us. But we do continue to hear appeals in both civil and criminal matters from Commonwealth countries like Antigua and Barbuda or Jamaica, from Crown dependencies such as the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man, and from overseas territories such as the Cayman Islands, Gibraltar, and the Turks and Caicos. And they keep us busier than you might think. In 2023, the JCPC delivered 44 judgments in 47 cases, the discrepancy being because some of the judgments were delivered for conjoined cases. For comparison, the number of UK Supreme Court judgments delivered in 2023 was 52. So last year, we delivered nearly the same number of Privy Council judgments as Supreme Court judgments. The appeals are certainly not evenly distributed among the different jurisdictions. Last year, almost a third of the cases brought were from Trinidad and Tobago, but other jurisdictions such as the Pitcairn Islands or St. Helena only send cases to us very uh, occasionally. For the Commonwealth countries that use the JCPC, the right of appeal is regulated by the constitution and the legislation of that country. In most appeals involving Commonwealth countries, appeals come as of right from citizens, which means they don't need to obtain permission to appeal either from the court that they're challenging or from us. Sometimes the right is dependent on the value of the claim, but the money figure has not kept pace with inflation. According to section 110A of the Jamaican constitution, you would have an appeal as of right from decisions of the Jamaican Court of Appeal, where the matter in dispute is of the value of a thousand Jamaican dollars or upwards, and that's currently just over five pounds sterling. Where no as of right appeal exists from the country, the JCPC has to consider whether to grant permission. For civil appeals, the test is the same really as the test for applications to appeal to the Supreme Court. That is, whether the appeal raises an arguable point of law of public importance, which ought to be considered at this time. And for criminal appeals, the test is whether there is a risk that a serious miscarriage of justice is concerned. So the cases we hear cover a huge range of topics. Some from jurisdictions which operate as tax shelters raise important issues about trusts or insolvency law. Other appeals raise questions of constitutional significance. Constitutional cases often require us to grapple with complex issues, including the death penalty, LGBTQ plus rights, and most recently, the constitutionality of anti-money laundering legislation. But there's a steady stream of smaller cases as well, such as land disputes between neighbors, as well as many criminal appeals. So let me turn to some of the cases which we have heard recently to illustrate how varied the topics are. Some involve fact patterns that are far removed from anything that we are likely to encounter in our Supreme Court work, whereas others sound all too familiar. Even in cases where the fact patterns have a familiar ring and could have arisen in our own towns and villages, it's important that the JCPC recognizes that it's dealing with local conditions, which are often very different from those which pertain here. So often, even if a decision is not one that we might have taken here, we will defer to the expertise and local knowledge of the judges in the court below as to how their society works and what their priorities are and I'll touch on a few of those as well. One of the most interesting JCPC cases I've sat on was a few months after I'd been sworn in as a justice, Fram Hine and the Attorney General of the Cook Islands. This was an appeal from the Cook Islands, which is a small group of islands in the South Pacific, about three hours flying time east of New Zealand. It was a judicial review challenge to a decision by the fishing minister setting the annual quota for how many tons of tuna fish could be caught off the coast of the Cook Islands 
by both local and international fishing vessels. The case had two main themes. The first was all about the international regime for managing fish stocks, particularly fishing for tuna, which I learned count as highly migratory fish, swimming hundreds of nautical miles. So this th part of the case involved an analysis of the different tiers of treaty obligations, starting with part five of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and every nation's right to fish in the waters that make up its exclusive economic zone, as well as the allocation of fishing rights on the high seas. And this is just one example of the value of JCPC case law. You get to look at all sorts of abstruse areas of the legal world. The second theme of the appeal was the relevance of the customary law of the Cook Islanders under their constitution. Article 66A of the Cook Islands constitution provides that the custom and usage of the indigenous Cook Islanders as the force of law, unless it's been overridden by Cook Island statute. Further, Article 66A says that the opinion of the Orangamana is conclusive about what that custom and usage is, and their opinion shall not be questioned in any court of law. Who are the Orangamana for this purpose? They are the collective of the chiefs and elders of the different islands and districts of the Cook Islands. Each district is known as a vaka, which is also the Maori word for the canoe, which the Cook Islands use to traditionally to voyage uh, huge distances across the Pacific Ocean. So in the hearing bundle before the board, we had many affidavits from Cook Islanders who were members of the Orangamana for their particular vaka. They asserted that they had a right under Cook Island's customary law to be consulted about anything to do with fishing rights. And so they challenged the decisions of the ministry setting the tuna fishing quota because they had not been consulted before the government decided on the amount of tuna that could be caught off their coast. The Cook Islanders refer to the Pacific Ocean by a Maori term, which I shall not attempt to pronounce, which, which translates as huge ocean of blue. The Orangamana are the tiaki, or guardians of the land and the sea, and hence of all the food in the sea, called the kaimuana. The evidence of the Orangamana showed that they were very concerned at what they thought was the overfishing of tuna, depleting the stocks of fish that were left available to be caught by the artisanal Maori fishermen off the coral reefs as one of the tribal chiefs put it movingly in her affidavit. Our children and grandchildren are heirs to the ocean and all that is in it, just as much as our land. They should be able to set out confidently on the vaca of our ancestors upon an ocean that is filled with the fish that I have seen with my own eyes and be able to catch that fish as we have caught it. I fear for them having to sail out over an ocean emptied of fish our waters deserted of the rich life that has been our heritage for hundreds of years. In the judgment which I drafted, we acknowledged the genuineness of their concerns, but we also found that it was clear from the evidence of the Orangamana, even accepting it at its, at its height, that there was no custom that they should be consulted generally about fishing. They only had a right to be consulted about imposing controls on overfishing, but that role had certainly been very clearly overtaken by legislation which had in, uh, implemented all the international treaties and the consultative bodies of which the Cook Islanders were members. So, whilst paying, I hope, due respect to the Orangamana, we had to dismiss their claim that they had a customary right to be consulted. Now, that case was a good example of the evolution of the JCPC PC, because we had to be very flexible about the time of day at which the case was heard. Both sides in the Cook Islands wanted to use counsel based in New Zealand. The problem was that although they're quite close geographically, New Zealand and the Cook Islands fall on different sides of the international date line. So they have a time difference of 22 hours. We arranged a two hour online hearing which took place between 7 and 9 p.m. on a Wednesday evening in London, where we were all sitting. 
but that two-hour slot was 10 a.m. to noon on the Wednesday morning in the Cook Islands, where the clients were all watching online, but 8 to 10 the following Thursday morning in New Zealand, where council were all based. But increasing our capability to hold remote and hybrid hearings in the JCPC has given much greater flexibility to council who've been able to take part in appeals from their jurisdiction. And this has helped to ensure that we can continue to deliver access to justice at a reasonable cost in ever-changing circumstances. The Cook Islands is of course a great tourist destination for those in Australia and New Zealand wishing to relax on beautiful coral sandy beaches under gently waving palm trees. And in recent years, we've heard a number of cases which have come up to the Privy Council where local people are objecting to the development of luxury resorts or condominiums along the beautiful coastlines of these islands. In these appeals, it's often the case that the local government on the island tends to favour the grant of permits to permit resorts uh, as it provides much needed employment, both during the construction phase of the project and more permanently. And it also brings in much needed foreign investment, which is useful for general spending. But it comes at a price for the environment and sometimes for the continued accessibility of the beautiful beaches and the sea for local people. One recent interesting case was a Privy Council appeal from the Bahamas, responsible development for Abaco against the Right Honourable Perry Christie. Perry Christie was the Prime Minister of the Bahamas at the relevant time. Abaco is a tiny island off the coast of the Bahamas with a beautiful little harbour called Little Harbour. There was already a golf course and a smart resort there, and the company which owned it wanted to include additional parking not just parking for more cars, but by building a marina out into the harbour for 44 private yachts. There was a petition signed by local residents objecting to the development. They, required, they described Little Harbour as a remote off the grid community where they have all worked hard to have as little impact on the environment as, the, as possible. The case raised an important point about costs, which although on its face is rather technical, required the board to address some important issues about public interest litigation involving the environment, something I know which would have been of particular interest to Emily Webster, who I know was a much respected environmental lawyer. And this can also be highly relevant in similar environmental challenges in England and Wales. So if a defendant on the receiving end of a legal claim is concerned that the claimant will not have enough money to pay its cost if the claim fails, the defendant can apply for, to the court for an order for security for costs. If security for costs is granted by the court, the claimant can then only proceed with the claim if it first produces a certain amount of money up front, paid into the court's bank account, to cover any potential costs order made against it at the end of the case. Now, if the claimant ultimately wins the case, then of course they get the money back. But if they lose, that money is then available to cover the winning defendant's costs. The problem is that if the order to give security for costs is set too high, it risks stifling the claim. And if it prevents the claimant from being able to bring the claim at all, then that raises access to justice issues. So the claimant in this Abaco case was a Bahamian company which was challenging the government's grant of permits for the development of the marina. The company alleged that the consultation that had been held with local population had been inadequate. The local high court in the Bahamas directed that if the claimant company wanted to pursue the claim, it had to pay into court 350,000 Bahamian dollars. That's about 300,000 pounds for security to cover the costs that the government and the resort developers would likely spend in defending the claim. So the case came up to the JCPC and as often happens, permission to intervene was given to two international bodies. In this case, the Open Society Justice Initiative and the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide. And they provided the board with written submissions to offer us a broad insight into the financial barriers facing public interest litigants. 
So the claimant company, Abaco, said they couldn't possibly afford to put up that amount of money as security, and if the order stood, they would have to drop the claim. They said the company was funded only by the sales of bumper stickers and T-shirts. They had a crowdfunding website, but that didn't really uh, raise enough money of, of that magnitude. And they said that the order would stifle the claim and so interfere with their constitutional and common law right of access to the court. The difficulty with Abaco's claim was that the ownership of the little company was very opaque. The government pointed out that there were indications that the company was in fact owned by some local people who already had their own very nice houses next door to the proposed development. So the government was suggesting that the motivation in bringing the challenge might not be entirely to do with protecting the green turtles, manatees, and piping plovers, as they claimed, but in protecting the value of their own properties. And if these local business people had clubbed together as individuals to bring the legal claim in their own name, then of course their own money would have been at risk if they lost and were ordered to pay the government's costs. And the government argued it's not right that these homeowners should set up this separate company which had no assets at all so that they could shelter behind that and put the whole risk of the litigation on the public purse. So in the judgment, the board established some useful principles about how security for costs applications should be approached in the context of, context of public interest litigation like this. First, the board overruled the decision of the Bahamas court in ordering security for the project developers costs in addition to the costs of the government. The board said it will only be in very rare cases that the developers will be entitled to security for costs over and above any security ordered for the benefit of the public body, which is the more direct respondent to the claim. And as for the security ordered for the government's costs, English law says that if an impecunious claimant wants to avoid giving security for costs, it has to be very open and candid with the court, in particular about why it can't raise the money it needs from third parties who are going to benefit from the litigation. So we accepted that particularly in environmental matters, there is sometimes no individual or group of individual with a private interest justifying bringing proceedings themselves. And the manatees and the piping plovers don't at the moment have access to the court themselves, so somebody has to step up on their behalf. But the problem was that Abaco had not been open and candid <coughs> and had not established that that was the position here. As the board said, in judicial review proceedings, there is always a general public interest to uphold the rule of law and to ensure that public bodies comply with their obligations under public law. But there's also a public interest in making sure that the government's limited resources should not be unduly depleted in meeting claims which it turns out have no merit. So the result was that the security for costs order was quashed so far as it benefited the development, but upheld in so far as it protected the government. And that's an example of a JCP judgment making a valuable contribution to the law more generally. So as a short digression, let me just say something about why all of those of you studying and working in the legal field in the UK should be aware of the JCPC's work. Because JCPC's decisions are not only binding precedent sometimes for the courts from which the appeals come, they can have precedential value in the UK legal system. So this question was considered in 2016 by the UK Supreme Court decision in Willers and Joyce. Lord Newberger in that case gave the judgment of a nine judge court. He noted that the JCPC is of course not a court of any part of the United Kingdom. And so its judgments cannot be binding on any judge in a court in England and Wales. But the Privy Council often applies the common law or local law that has been drafted based on UK legislation. And also at least four of the five judges sitting on any appeal will be justices of the Supreme Court. So Lord Newberger said that unless there's a decision of a superior court to the contrary effect, a court in England and Wales can normally be expected 
to follow a decision of the JCPC, but not if there's a decision of an English court which would otherwise be binding on it according to the normal rules of seniority. But he added a, an option for the future that when the JCPC is hearing an appeal that involves an, uh, an issue which also arises in English law, it might uh, contain a challenge to a previous decision, either of the JCPC or of the House of Lords or the Supreme Court, as in fact happens in Willers and Joyce, where there seem to be two inconsistent judgments at that level. And Lord Newberger says it is open to the JCPC if they overturn a previous House of Lords or Supreme Court case to say that that is overturned not only for the JCPC jurisdiction from which the appeal has come, but also uh, for England and Wales as well. I'm not aware of that having happened in any case, somebody here may know better, but it's something that we've kept up our sleeve uh, if needed. But cases from the Caribbean do not all concern high-end uh, resorts and parking for private yachts. We also get an insight, sadly, into the violence that mars some of their communities, just as it mars some of ours. One case recently read like a Sherlock Holmes mystery of the body in a locked room genre. The appellant had been convicted of shooting his wife at point blank range through the head. His case was that she had committed suicide. There was no apparent reason either for him to murder her or for her to kill herself. The case turned on two points, whether the supposed suicide note found in the bedroom had been written by the deceased woman or whether it was actually the accused who had written it. And secondly, there was an issue of whether it was physically possible for him to have killed her. Her body was found in the bathroom, seated with her back leaning against the inside of the bathroom door. The forensic evidence was that given the position of her body, it was impossible for him to have shot her in the bathroom, then left the bathroom through that door against which she was leaning, and then to have run into the sitting room where there were people a few seconds later after the shot was heard, but without any blood on his clothes. So we overturned the conviction and held that there had been a serious miscarriage of justice, both in the way the forensic evidence about the handwriting of the note had been analyzed and because of new evidence that we allowed to be introduced about ballistics and blood spatter. And a criminal case which gave rise to an interesting human rights issue was an appeal by a 16-year-old youth who had been sentenced to 15 years imprisonment for a robbery where he shot and wounded his victim when robbing him of a mobile phone in a street crime. And that case raised the issue whether the mandatory minimum sentence of 15 years for, imprison of, for wounding with a gun, uh, which could be imposed in Jamaica on anybody over the age of 14, whether that was uh, consistent with the provisions of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, which had been ratified by Jamaica. And the board held that the legislature was entitled to enact a stringent minimum sentence, even for a 14 or 15 year old, uh, because of the um, very serious problems of gun crime in, in young people uh, in Jamaica. So let me now turn to a couple of cases that raise issues which might well arise uh, in our, our own domestic law and see whether we deal with them in the same way or differently. Uh, the JCPC jurisdictions, like every legal uh, system in the world, had to respond quickly to the threat and then the eventuality of the COVID pandemic. In the UK, of course, we had our own COVID regulations enforcing lockdown, and there was a judicial review challenge to the legality of those. In the Queen against Dolan and the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, the English Court of Appeal, presided over by the then Lord Chief Justice, considered a challenge to the restrictions on, imposed in lockdown in England, and that challenge was dismissed by the Court of Appeal, and the uh, validity of the regulations was upheld. So the JCPC recently heard a similar challenge to the COVID regulations that had been introduced in Trinidad and Tobago. In March and June 2020, the Minister for Health in Trinidad and Tobago had used powers conferred on him by a public health ordinance 
which had been adopted way back in 1940 to deal with epidemics and other health emergencies. One of the restrictions imposed was to prohibit gatherings of more than five people without reasonable justification. And the regulations also prohibited gatherings of more than 10 people for religious worship unless they complied with guidelines issued by the ministry. In Suraj against the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Suraj challenged these laws because he had been prosecuted for being at a party where there had been more than five people. <coughs> and another claimant to Mr. Maharaj was a Hindu pundit, and he challenged the limit imposed of 10 people attending religious gatherings. Because of the provisions of the Trinidad and Tobago Constitution, the case was not as straightforward as the English equivalent challenge in Dolan. This was because a lot of the very difficult JCP cases are those which concern the application of laws which predate the adoption by the jurisdiction of a constitution, particularly a constitution then entrenching uh, certain human rights. So although the constitution of the country contains a bill of rights often based on the European Convention on Human Rights, there's usually a provision in the constitution that says the pre-existing laws already in force at the time the constitution is adopted cannot be challenged as being contrary to the human rights norms. So the issue in Suraj was whether having exercised in 2020 a power under a public ordinance that dated back to 1940, how did that existing, uh, that saving for existing law uh, apply? Uh, and we held that the because the regulations had been adopted uh, after the adoption of the constitution, they could not rely on the existing law savings clause in the constitution, even though they'd been adopted under a, a much earlier ordinance. Um, Alignment, and we did uphold the regulations broadly for similar reasons to those uh, relied on in Dolan. But a line of cases where we've come to a very different answer from the answer that prevails in this jurisdiction are in the death penalty cases. And since the start of this century, the board has heard a number of appeals relating to the imposition of the death penalty in some of these jurisdictions. And clearly, the death penalty was set for murder in these cases long before their constitutions were adopted. And so it's usually saved from human rights challenge because of those kinds of existing law savings. So the developments uh, recently were reviewed in 2022 in Chandler and the, and the state in which it was held that the mandatory sentence of death is lawful under the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. And that was the case, even though it was accepted that the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment now prohibited by their constitution and so would have been unlawful if it had been adopted after the constitution uh, have, had taken effect. Uh, but some aspects of the death penalty have been mitigated by decisions of the board. Uh, in particular, it's been held that where a prisoner is held on death row for longer than five years, there will be strong grounds for believing that delay in execution would be such as to constitute inhuman and degrading treatment. And that was decided in Pratt and Morgan in 1994. As the board explained in that judgment delivered in 1993, uh, those prisoners had been on death row in a prison in Jamaica since 1979. Uh, and on three occasions, the death warrant had been read to them and they had been removed to the condemned cells immediately adjacent to the gallows, only then to be reprieved. And as Lord Griffiths said in his opinion, the statement of these bare facts is sufficient to bring home to the mind of any person of normal sensitivity and compassion the agony of mind that these men must have suffered as they alternated between hope and despair in the 14 years that they've been in prison facing the gallows. So once five years has gone by, it's no longer possible for them to be executed. So that then raised the question, well, it, when the sentence has to be commuted because of that delay, what is the alternative sentence? And in Boudram and the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago in 2022, um, the board held that it's not automatically commuted to a sentence of life imprisonment. The sentencing court has power to impose any other lawful penalty, 
penalty uh, other than a sentence of death. So where does that leave us? 100 years ago, Viscount Haldane described the function of the, J of the JCPC as not to claim any fresh rights to interfere, but to act as statesmen should, being willing to help if called in, but not pressing assistance where assistance is not desired. And looking back at the balance of my own case law since I joined the court in 2021, I see we are still being called in to help in a large number of cases. And in deciding these cases, the JCPC, I hope, continues to, to evolve and to contribute to the development of law across the globe on questions of considerable contemporary importance. Thank you. I must say that was magnificent. <laughs> you have given us an elegant and erudite glimpse into a, a world that most of us have never encountered, indeed a parallel universe. Um, it was always said that the role of the BBC is to educate, inform and entertain. And I have to say, you've amply fulfilled <laughs> those, those conditions, Lady Rose. Uh, now, you have very kindly agreed to take some questions uh, from the audience. So without me saying any more, may I invite a question? I should say that a microphone will be passed in your direction if you do put your hand up. Don't let that put you off there. Yes. Oh, thank you. First. Yeah. Let's see. If, yes, that works as well. Um, <laughs> you spoke about the caseload being not dissimilar to that of the Supreme Court. You also spoke about there being no permission gateway. Um, Scotland had no permission gateway briefly, and then that was somewhat closed down. Um, do you end up with many cases that you wonder whether it might be dealt with better by a different court, or actually are they mostly cases that it you were very happy to deal with? Uh, there is, even with cases which have an appeal as of right, we do have a filtering mechanism which was decided some time ago, which is if the case is absolutely without merit, then we can dismiss it without having a hearing. Um, until quite recently, what used to happen was rather unsatisfactory, which was that the appeal would come up, five of us would prepare for it, we would all meet up in the morning and say, this is completely hopeless, um, and then it would take sort of half an hour when we would say to the appellant, look, you know, what are you saying? And we would chuck it out. And that was a waste of everybody's time. So we've now introduced a mechanism whereby there's a sort of triaging of appeals as of right. Uh, and if somebody uh, thinks that it might actually not have any merit, um, then it goes to it goes to a single justice. The parties are written to saying that the board is minded to dismiss this appeal uh, unless you can persuade us otherwise. We receive written submissions and then a board of three justices will decide whether to, to knock it out. Um, the most common reason is um, that what they're seeking to challenge are findings of fact that were made by the High Court. They were upheld by the Court of Appeal saying, the High Court judge saw the witnesses and has made a decision as who is telling the truth. The Court of Appeal is not prepared to interfere with it. We're not going to interfere with it. So those do quite often get knocked out, even if they are an appeal of, as of right. That's a very British solution. If I <laughs> and none the worse for that. I, yeah. I see another couple of hands. Ooh. There was a hand, I think, in the middle, or we can go. There's just the yes. person yes. there. Yeah. Yeah. I can shout if that's. Yes, on the halfway there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this relates to uh, whether you have any concerns over the cases that are brought to you that in the way the lawyers present. Uh, I think uh, Robin Knowles mentioned a few things in a Nigerian arbitration last year, concerns over the the way the lawyers were presenting the case. Do you ever come across similar difficult situations? Uh, th the lawyers are partly London-based lawyers and partly local lawyers. Um, 
obviously these cases are being fought here for hundreds of years uh, and there is a group of lawyers in a couple of sets of London chambers which very much specialize in doing these privy council cases and they are as good as or as bad as the general run of council that we have and they still seem quite often they still seem to be retaining that work uh, but of course, since COVID pushed everybody to be more hybrid, uh, we now do have um, uh, counsel from uh, the local jurisdiction and we do make uh, allowances for that, particularly if they're from the uh, Caribbean, we usually sit from one till four so they don't have to get up at the crack of dawn. Um, and, uh, I've not experienced particular concerns. Uh, we do get, of course, the top of the profession. Um, and uh, yeah, usually they're, they're very good. Um, they are, of course, all qualified under a system which is partly modeled on our system. So I'm, I, you know, some of them are not terribly good, but some Barristers in England are not terribly good either. It's surprising how that is the case. Um, uh, they must be good at other aspects of the job, I would say, if I'm being kind. But um, so uh, I've I've not I've not encountered a particular problem. Thank you. James. Um, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, um, it seems to me you put out a very convincing case that, uh, that there's huge value in this and that Lord Hildane's um, description of the role that you described still stands. The only question I can see about it, uh, other than benefit in the existing system, is uh, if there's an analogy with the example we have with arbitrators, for example, in Hong Kong, being criticised for uh, providing the UK justice experience to substantiate regimes that are controversial from our perspective. And obviously because the jurisdictions you're dealing with have that common law heritage, the English law heritage, that's not been an acute issue. I mean, how, how much of an issue do you see that potentially being? I'm not aware of any particular concerns. And in a sense, are you talking about concerns about the independence of the judiciary locally? I'm, I'm talking or? more about uh, a jurisdiction that imposes legislation that is... Oh, I uh, see. That, is, uh, ...that you are right, required that, to give... Yes, to, yes. ...which is regarded as despotic or abusive or limiting of human rights, I'd, you would expect. Yes. I, I mean, they, as I've said in my lecture, there are some laws that we enforce which are not norms that we have here um, and I, I'm again I'm not aware that that has been a particular problem it may become a problem when that sort of thing becomes a problem you're then in this odd position as to whether actually we are then a bulwark against that to some extent or whether we are giving respectability to that and that, if it ever arose, would be a decision that we would take in conjunction with the Foreign Office, and um, that would be above my pay grade, put it like that. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lady Rose, for your very interesting talk. Uh, my name is Sharon Thomas. Um, you might not have noticed, but this week there's been um, a raging debate on that reliable source of information, X, formerly known as Twitter, um, about um, a case of a well-known Jamaican reggae artist called Vibes Cartel, who I think is in the process of appealing to the, the Privy Council. And there's just been this huge debate um, in the diaspora community of the Caribbean as to whether he should be allowed to appeal to the Privy Council. On one side, people are very much, um, the JCPC is a relic of empire. And as you know, there is a, a, a republicanist sort of yes. push now. Um, and so people are outraged about what, what he's doing in his appeal, um, mainly because, you know, he's, he's of his reputation for what he's done locally in the local context as you refer to you know crime is high and so on um but a lot of the other comments were saying um that the local judiciary or at least people feel that um local members of the judiciary are exposed to um 
well, potentially exposed to corruption. I mean, I don't know how it's true, it's just what you know people say. So that's very much the debate that's raging at the moment. And I was just thinking, you know, there is a Caribbean um, appeal court. Mm. And do you think at some point the JCPC might just say, well, look, we don't want, we don't need to be involved as the ultimate court here because you have your local regional court there? Um, two points to make about that. I know that there is this controversy in Jamaica more generally um, about the continued use of the JCPC. And in a rare move, the, the president of the Supreme Court did actually write to a local Jamaican newspaper to correct some points that it was felt were were slightly misleading, uh, saying, for example, there have been an article saying, oh, you have to use local London council and it's all terribly expensive. And, and so the court wrote a letter um, to the newspaper saying, no, that's not true. We do have hybrid hearings. You can use local council if you want. That's whatever reasons there are for not continuing to use the, the council, that's not one of them. Um, for a lot of these uh, countries, the continued use of the Privy Council was part of the overall negotiation for their for decolonization. Um, and so it was it was something that was part of the structure that was put in place in their constitutions as part of the negotiations for them ceasing to be colonies or becoming republics or whatever. And I think because it was regarded as something at that stage that they definitely wanted and that we were prepared to provide, I don't see us ever initiating moving away from it. We will, as far as I'm aware, we will do it for as long as anybody wants us to do it. Of course, the caseload varies when it had India and New Zealand and Canada. Of course, there were many more cases, presumably. But as long as there are some jurisdictions that want us to do it, um, then I think we will. I think maybe just one more question. I think, uh, I think that, uh, sorry, if I could just add to that, I think what the president said in the letter that he wrote is that we consider it an honour to be able to hear these cases and uh, that's certainly something I feel as well as finding them fascinating and enjoyable to sit on. Lady Rose, I'm intrigued by the appointment process and it sounds as if it's automatic when you become a Court of Appeal judge. Mm. And indeed, I hope that um, an old Queensman who is Secretary of the Privy Council, Richard Tilbrook, I, I trust that he's involved in bringing you forward to kiss the... Queen or King's hand. Um, I'm interested, was Lord Sumption, who, as I recall, jumped to the Court of Appeal, did he also become a yes. member of the JCPC? Yes. Uh, and similarly, Lord Burroughs, who was made a... Uh, uh, yes. So they are both in the position that they are Lord Sumption and Lord Burroughs, although not actual members of the House of Lords. That's just a courtesy title. Um, and they are sworn in to be privy councillors. What they don't have is a knighthood. And we do sometimes remind Lord Thank you. Thank you so much. Because that's what you get when you join the High Court. And there's no particular reason, other than that they jolly well should have one, that they've not been given one. Uh, but they do need to be privy councillors, yeah. Thank you. I think we need to let you off. Okay. Um, I must say, I must say that when I first saw the uh, title, which quite literally begs the question, I thought perhaps a good way to end would be to take a vote amongst the audience. I will not do that. I will merely say that, however we feel, whichever way we would vote, we could certainly now have all the evidence and all the information <laughs> upon which to make um, a balanced decision. I should also just say, very briefly, I'm suddenly transported back to BB36 in 19, whenever it was. Anyway, <laughs> um, can we please thank Lady Rose again for her splendid contribution? Thank you. Thank you.